I'm Asher Miller. I'm Rob Dietz. I'm Jason Bradford. Welcome to Crazy Town, where this land ain't your land, this land ain't my land, this land belongs to king and queen. This is producer Melody Travers. In this season of Crazy Town, Jason, Asher, and Rob are exploring the watershed moments in history that have led humanity into the cascading crises we face in the 21st century. Today's episode unpacks the peculiar history of land privatization. The watershed moment took place in the year 1773. At the time, the estimated carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was 278 parts per million, and the global human population was 770 million. Okay, guys, um, I'm here to initiate Crazy Town Poetry Corner. Are you ready? Oh, man. Uh, I got one. Yeah? There once was a man from Nantucket. No, 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 no. Let's not get filthy. This is a family program. Is this this your cultured accent voice kind of thing going on? Is that what that is? This This is is like his kindergarten teacher accent. Guys, listen up. This is a very important poem that talks about a very important... Period in history. Are you ready? Ready. Please. Please do something with that. That voice of yours. (laughs) The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but lets the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. The law demands that we atone when we take things we do not own, but leaves the lords and ladies fine who take things that are yours and mine. Wow. I, I really like that rhyme scheme. Super simple. Like you got stuff like, and when I squeeze the golden goose, I can drink lots of golden juice. Yes. That was the next stanza, but I wasn't <laughs> going there. <laughs> um, that, that's a nice poem, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, I, it's I, sorry. We didn't even applaud you. Thank you. There, there you Thank go. you. So that's, I think you wrote that, right? We, no, no, this is, this is like, this is like, um, middle ages in, uh, in, in England, basically. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah, a like, lot. A unattributed poem. Hello, Governor. Unattributed. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Governor. That's right. <laughs> now, that, that's a poem about geese, but it's also about what was happening at the time related to resources and, and quote unquote ownership. But I have another question, though, before we get into the meat of the show. Okay. What's a bird that's bigger than a goose? Ostrich. Yeah. Uh, okay. He took uh, mine. Uh, emu. 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 Yeah. Moa. Okay. Moa from New Zealand. Okay. They were like but, 10 but, feet tall. Dodo bird? Was Dodo but, bird bigger? But in England. Oh, in oh. England. Uh, yes. Big bird. Big bird. Yeah. Big bird's uh, not English. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> swan. Yes. Swan. You got it. Okay. So... During Elizabeth I's reign, the swan was a very popular dish for feasts for the royalty. They would and eat the swan. they had this system in place. Somehow the royal chefs where they stuffed the carcass of a swan with nine other birds. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. Have you it's heard like, of it? Have you heard like of a tur- Russian nesting doll? Yes. Have you ever heard of turducken? Which is yeah, something happens in the that south. That sounds like that, that sounds like that's, a, that's amateur two birds. hour. Yeah, yeah, I know. yeah amateur hour. It's I like, could I could conceptually yeah. make a turducken. I don't think I can make a nine bird. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They, like they stuff the small bird up the cloaca. Let me, let me of the tell next you. It's like the hummingbird. Let me read it. Let me read it. It's it's a nesting doll descending order, like you say. Uh-huh. Okay. Inside the swan is a goose. Inside the goose is a duck. Inside the duck is a mallard. I guess it was a smaller breed of duck. Inside the mallard's a chicken. Inside the chicken's a pheasant. Inside the pheasant's a partridge. Inside the partridge's a chicken. And inside the uh, sorry, the pigeon. And inside the pigeon is a woodcock. So wow. um, yeah, what some pretty hell? pretty good stuff. Like, can you imagine trying to like take your knife and get through all nine layers? Uh, Are they all like shoved up each other's butts? Is that how it works? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't have so, detailed uh, okay. bon appetit. I remember in the eighties we used to go to Taco Bell and get a seven layer burrito. I thought that had a lot of ingredients, but if I could get a yeah. nine layer bird, I yeah. mean that's yeah. Well, okay. Well, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because first of all, swans are owned by the queen. I don't want you to think 
even dare imagine you swans are by the that queen? you could make a swan dinner like this yourself. As enticing as it is, the swans are the queens, for God's sakes. You know this, don't you? No. What are you talking about? Okay, okay. Well, this goes back a long ways, but... Over time, the royalty of that part of the world basically just sort of take sort of taken over ownership of almost everything. You know. Wait. So, are you telling me that to this day, right now? Yeah. The Queen of England owns all the fucking swans in England. Yeah. yeah. This is almost as dumb as making a meal out of a swan stuffed with a goose, stuffed with a chicken, <laughs> stuffed with a duck, stuffed yeah. with. Does a- she still have this for like uh, for a meal once? I a year? think they've moved on, but yeah, there's still ceremonies just go to for talk the last. About them you know, for the last uh, uh, several hundred years or so, they're still counting uh, the royal uh, swans. Hey, um, can I get one of those swans over here? No, that's <laughs> mine, my swan. <laughs> well, how does she know if somebody's taking a swan? Yeah, well, you know, there are people that have gotten in trouble. There's some recent people that have been fined and imprisoned for eating or capturing swans. Anyway, the big, the bigger picture here is let's get to the watershed moment because I bring this up. It's just, just an example of what's called the enclosure of the commons in general. And in particular, I want to focus on the Enclosure Act of 1773. Hmm. The reason this is a big deal is that beyond all other previous enclosure acts that have been going on, this one basically was structured to basically give those who wanted to privatize essentially carte blanche to make it so. So you're saying uh, this this act gets passed and therefore now I can claim all the swans, all the land. No, no, because the... you're just a common. Oh, right. right. No, I can't no, claim no, shit. No, no, but... no, 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 no. You can never eat swan again. <laughs> okay. Well, let's uh, let's step back for a sec here because you're using these fancy terms like you yeah, always like do. Swan. You yeah, academic swan. types. Yeah, like swan, <laughs> duck, and goose. <laughs> no, these terms like enclosure of the commons. And I think it's important to talk for a minute about what's meant by the commons. Well, why don't you do that? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm a member of this really cool group. It's called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, or We All. And they put out these briefing papers every once in a while. And there's one I found recently written by Monroe Fraser and Thomas Mand. And they listed a few ways to think about commons. And I'm going to give those to you, sort of going from the most uh, physical to the most abstract. So, so one way is you can think of the commons as an entity, something like a forest or a fishery, right? Something that is... is uh, like a, a, a quote-unquote resource. Yeah, yeah. But, but there's also an attached governance piece to that. It's mm. not just the resource, but it, there's also some way that people manage that resource. So okay. that's one way of thinking about a commons. Another way to think about it is that it's an entirely alternative system of resource governance that's separate from what we normally think of as the the two big systems today, the market and the government or the state. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a commons-based resource governance system is it's designed by a community of people who share the resource. Okay, so not the professional technocrat to bureaucratic class, but it's actually the people that are living with and associated with maybe benefiting from those resources are involved in the management decisions. Right, exactly. Okay. And then there's a third kind of uh, most abstract way to think of the commons, and that's sort of a alternative social paradigm or a different way of thinking that acknowledges our connectedness with each other, our shared heritage, and our shared responsibility for ensuring well-being for future generations. Okay. Thank you for that. That, yeah. that helps. Definitions. You're good at that kind of stuff. But we're, I mean, we're talking the first one mostly here with enclosure, the original enclosure of the commons in, the, in, in yeah. Britain. We're talking taking land. But it has, it has implications for what you also talked about in terms of the mental models people walk around with, you know, how they think about the world. So I think that's important. And mm-hmm. Let me let me back up again, since you know. Uh, let's let's put this into context. Let's never go forward. Yeah. Let's, just, let's just keep backing yeah, up. Re- keep reversing. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking. Imagine you're a member of of a tribe or a or a, or a hamlet of peasants, and um, in this situation, you basically are living directly off the land or the waterways and the coastal resources, and and you don't own per se any of these these are all held in common and 
nobody could tell you you couldn't go somewhere to hunt or forage or collect wood as long as you belong to that particular area and were and were basically associated with the commons and its management. And so this is an astonishing way to think about the world. Because right now, I mean, I, I, I look outside and look at the farm. It's all divvied up. Like, I don't just go walk across my neighbor's property. I well, just feel weird about doing this is, that. This is messed up because I was looking at a map of your property. And you live one mile away from my favorite brewery, yeah. which we would have to <laughs> cut across. Uh, Private property. Yeah, like yeah. Farmer Jackoff's field over here, <laughs> who would probably <laughs> shoot me on the way. And uh, yeah. I, I'm... Uh, yeah, like it sounds like the way you were describing uh, before would be kind of a lot more fun. Oh, explore, you just go exploring or whatever and like hunt mushrooms or hunt game. And how, how it kind of worked in these agrarian settings with these peasants is they, they met and they would divvy up arable land fairly. And the local lord and royal class, like in the manor system, they mostly stayed out of this. It, it, maybe if, they, if there's disputes, they would get involved. But most of the way that people interacted with the world were like this, and they and they, they persisted for hundreds or thousands of years. And there's there's there are mechanisms for individuals to work with their talent and improve their situation in life. There are systems for sharing what you could not be managed individually, like teams of oxen or making cheese. So they sort of figured out like with a very low overhead, right? They're just kind of doing it themselves, how to live in a place. I think what's interesting for me in in thinking about this a little bit is that we tend to contrast sort of Western ways of of organizing and dealing with with property and land and resources. And we contrast that with like indigenous cultures, for example, Right. right? And we say, and we've talked about this with colonization, right? Like, yeah. This idea that we come in and we can conquer and own all this land and it's all theirs for ours uh, to to do what we want with, but it's interesting to think that there's this dynamic of commoning, right? Yeah. If you want to use a verb, in in Europe. Oh yeah, that was you know, the way. In, yeah, right. Even though they had kings and fucking aristocrats and right. whatever else they had, they had a caste system or kind of a hierarchy in, of power in society. There's still this dynamic of sharing resources collectively in a community. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's the way it was. Yeah. yeah. One example that's been explained is called the open field system. This is just one representation of how commons can work, but each farmer in this open field system, they didn't have their own farm or, or pay rent to work it, but the field would get divvied up based on a, a bunch of criteria, like what's a healthy crop rotation? What's the local ecology? What, uh, what, what kind of traditions do we have in this area? And it was also tied even to the technology they had at the time. They had, you know, oxen pulling a plow and it was really hard to turn that plow around. So they would divvy this land, this open field into really long strips and say, okay, uh, Farmer Jason, you you take that strip this season a share. You take that strip, Rob. You're not allowed to farm because you suck. You go over there and do something else. <laughs> so we could have a strip that goes a mile straight to the <laughs> right. to the local. Yes, brewery, right? that's my part. I'll bring <laughs> you guys beers. Yeah, okay. right. Love it. Love yeah, it. Yeah, so totally different than these sort of square fields chunked out, right? You know, surveyed and and fenced. fenced it was just off like. And- yeah. No, go. This is your strip of wheat. This is your strip um, of barley or whatever. So, yeah, fascinating. And it wasn't just to point out, it wasn't just arable land, right? Commoners had historic rights to fisheries and marshes and forests. And, you know, I know that we'll get more into kind of the impacts of, of this change in, in society through this act that we're talking about and other laws that were, that were passed to, to take that away. It goes way back, this sort of struggle, like the story of Robin Hood, right? Yeah. Robin Hood, the ballads go back to the early Middle Ages. But it's interesting, by the early 1800s, there was like, there was a critique already at, at that point, they sort of changed what the ballads were because they were passed down orally, I guess, oral tradition, to critiquing the so-called forest laws that barred hunting and forest harvesting by, by peasants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... uh 
I, I just, when you're talking about Robin Hood, I just think of the Errol Flynn movie. You guys ever see that old, I uh, haven't seen old that Robin one. Hood? There's it, so many. I think it's from the 60s, but it won, it won Best Picture. I mean, but it's hilarious. It's like this guy running around in green gymnastics tights. Men and, in tights. And he just, he just kind of goes, ah, ha, ha, ah, ha, <laughs> and he stabs some aristocrat and, and goes <laughs> off, swings on a vine, ah, ha, ha. Yeah. Yeah. The sheriff in those days was actually had a lot to do with forest management. So that term is interesting, you know. Uh, yeah, the sheriff right. of Nottingham. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Nottingham Forest is a big forest. Sherwood Forest. Yeah. Well, okay, so we have this whole notion of the commons, we have uh, this long history, but why in the hell was this happening where you got this 1773 act and you got this this history that led up to that and and people are starting to privatize stuff that, that means taking away people's livelihoods? My one word answer to that is economics. Basically start following the money, following Wealth the power. power. Yeah. Think about it. The wealthy people... They are looking for ways to make money, increase their power. Well, one of the things that they realize is, hey, we can sell a bunch of wool, but we need people to to be shepherds. We need people out there uh, managing this process. Well, if they're not able to farm this land, uh, then I can push them out to to deal with the sheep. Or let's say uh, you've got global trade starting to pop up and you need wood for your boats. You know, it's like, okay, I can push these people out of the forest and now I get the big trees to make the boats that I that I want to have. Yeah, and there's a lot of discussion at the time. We're talking going back to the 11th century through the 1800s. As you get as you get more and more towards uh, what we're talking about in the, the, this act, the the discussion really talks a lot about efficiencies and really denigrating the peasants for <laughs> not being efficient. And what was fascinating? <laughs> what an insult! You damn inefficient peasant! You yeah. Well, what, it, what it's about is that the 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 rentier class, in a sense, could extract higher rents from farms that were larger growing commodities. So and this is sort of there in their mind, there's a highest and best use case to be made for, for kicking the peasants off and getting this into sort of private hands that are consolidated production and measuring in this perspective, they get a higher rent. However, this was not actually the best way to grow more food. So people looking at this at the time could show that the small scale farmers that were primarily feeding their families could produce a lot more per acre, let's say. But they, they weren't really generating a lot of cash, and so they really couldn't pay rent to the same degree. Right? Ah, wow. That's, uh, yeah, let's end that practice. Yeah. I hate so, like, it when people feed their families. Right. Yeah. right. So in terms of like— Self-sustaining. That sucks. Yeah, exactly. So in terms of efficiency, it was the, the peasant farmer with, a, with small lots was very good at getting a lot of food per acre— but not a lot of money per acre. Metrics like uh, dollar per acre, dollar per anything, that's always uh, the the uh, way to a sustainable economy. <laughs> always. It's how we judge everything yeah. to this day. Yeah. Except in their case, it was pounds, right? We, we touched on this a little bit, but this uh, the Enclosure Act of 1773 is, we picked it as our watershed moment, but it really is part of a, of a history that went on for, for centuries. You know, this this gradual degradation of of the commons you know this this push to turn what was in common into private property and you know interestingly there there's you know some uh discussion theories hearkening all the way back to the norman conquests is this like norm from cheers what do you mean by that yeah it was a whole bunch of norms norman bates from psycho stabbing everyone (laughs) in the shower (laughs) oh yeah he'd win every war (laughs) the normans coming from the continent of europe yes um Conquering the the British Isles right and, across the Channel, right? They're just yeah, across the Channel. channel. Easy. Yeah, they took the. They were, um, they were excellent the swimmers. The ch- they took the they, channel. They, <laughs> they took the channel. Yeah, the. Um, <laughs> you know, when they conquered the the Saxons, when they conquered the you know England, those the, those lands, they they installed their own aristocracy and they they rewarded their backers essentially mm-hmm. with land. So. This, in a sense, was the beginning of a process of saying, well, this this can't be held in common. You know, we need to, to somehow yeah. grab it, control it, whether we're making rent off of it or we're you know passing it off to cronies or, or people who support our, us to maintain power. And over the centuries, there were various laws that were enacted. This one, I think, was really a key one because it was a serious legitimation 
of it through the the parliament, the mm-hmm. British Parliament, of this ongoing process. And you know, I think it also tied into this this acceleration of globalization, which I think we'll talk a little bit about. Yeah, about as well. I I do want to go back to uh, Robin Hood for a sec, who is like your emblem of of resistance. You know, yeah. the, the sort of myth of it. And you know, you're talking about how. There's this erosion over time where the aristocracy is coming in and taking away and taking away and chipping away. But at the same time, I think there, you know, it's probably much more untold history, but there's always resistance, protests, uprisings. And there, there's a few that you can find that are actually named. But like the poem that you started yeah. us off with, Jason, is clearly a, a protest of, hey, give me my goose back. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, a lot I, of violence. There was a lot of violence yeah. associated with this. A lot of draconian crackdown. Oh, yeah. medieval levels of violence. A lot of Literally aristocrats. Yeah. Uh, a lot of aristocrats were shoved up the cloaca of a swan. Uh, <laughs> as a the headings was very common. It wasn't the Norman Bates thing, the stabbing. <laughs> they would just cut your head off. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, th- this particular act is impactful and in uh, the 1773 Enclosure Act in a number of ways. But uh, one of the main ones we, we're focusing on is that it sped things up, right? It, it really allowed for a rapid loss of commons, mm-hmm. which tied into the Industrial Revolution and the need for urban wage labors. Right. And this was a very conscious process. And there was an incredible amount of shade thrown at peasants, commoners, so to speak. So I, I've got a quote from this guy named John Middleton. He was a London and Middlesex County historian from this period. Big proponent of enclosure. you, you got to do it in a posh British accent. Oh, do that. The commons were of real injury to the public by holding out a lure to the poor man, by affording him materials wherewith to build his cottage and ground to erect it upon, together with firing and the run of this poultry and pigs for nothing. This is, of course, temptation, sufficient to induce a great number of poor persons to settle upon the borders of such commons. But the mischief does not end here, for having gained (laughs) these trifling advantages through the neglect or connivance of the lord of the manor, it unfortunately gives their minds an improper bias— and inculcates a desire to live from that time forward without labor, or at least with as little as possible. So, so wait, what's that guy's name again? Uh, Douchebag John. <laughs> I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> wait, so I can't think of a... Uh, like, you want to go back in time and just punch him in the face. Th- think about how industrious you would have needed to be to, be, to like be taking care of yourself and your family... Hey. By, you know, working with your community to to get what you need off of the commons. Like, I know. He's talking about he's running. They're running their poultry. They're running their he, pigs. They're, you know, they're building their own cottages these, from the woods. He's trifling. Like, what, <laughs> awful. These poor people that don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hideous. I know. It is pretty bad. But, but it, it talks about what was lost, right? Yeah. It, but getting back to what you just talked on, uh, Jason, around the Industrial Revolution, I think this is really key in the timing of the Enclosure Act, because we talked earlier about profit seeking from from rent, you know, renting yeah. of, of of land. We we have a situation as the, as the Industrial Revolution is ramping up in Britain, and we have to remember that this was where it really started. Yeah, right. They got a head start. With um, they needed to. To get fucking people into the factories, right? To go make cheap goods and flood the global market with them, right? So they had to shut down local craftspeople. They had to basically take folks off of the land, in a sense, and, and stick them in the factories to, to support the, the growth of the this industrial revolution. Woohoo! We got Dickens. <laughs> well, and this stuff continues on, right? Like the 20th century ideology that, that just wants to crush the commons. You guys may be aware of the ecologist Garrett Hardin and his uh, ridiculously famous paper called Tragedy of the Commons. Yes, very influential. Yeah, I mean, that that term is ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it became, it's weird because you don't really think an academic paper is going to turn into a common everyday uh, uh, like colloquial saying. Well, it, it but... fed into what certain people wanted to hear as yeah. what happened. Well, let me give you, I want to give you a, a quote that sort of where he lays out his thesis. This is out of the paper. He says... And this was in 1968, uh, yeah, I think. Okay. So, yeah. So, you know, long time ago, but not 
not all that long ago. <laughs> long uh, time ago. That's like around when we were born. Yeah. Making me feel yeah. old. Yeah. Well, you are old. Yeah. Over I mean, half you, a century ago. You don't remember the 1773 Act, but, uh, you know. <laughs> just barely. It was just before my time. Yeah. So uh, here's Garrett, Garrett Hart, and he says, and I, I guess he was probably American, so I'm not going to yeah. do your posh uh, British Californian, accent. Californian, I think. Yeah. The, the rational herdsman concludes that the only sensible course for him to pursue is to add another animal to his herd. This, this is talking about if I had a, an open access field right. of grass. So it says, add another animal to his herd. And another. And another. But this is the conclusion reached by each and every rational herdsman sharing a commons. Therein is the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit in a world that is limited. Ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom in a commons brings ruin so to all. Bizarre. This is yeah. such a bizarre thing. So talking about ecological limits, right? Yeah. When you look at our our economy, <laughs> it is the the economy that we have now, where everything is essentially privatized and totally about self interest. Yeah, that's what's driving us it to is the ironic, limit. Like to it? think that that people don't know how to fucking compromise with one another in a community. Well, that's it. Know? He took uh, sort of that Homo economicus yeah. idea, this economic man who is just a rational money grabber and not like. Like, I'm just going to go out and take what I can and not worry that you're just going to come kick my ass tomorrow. Yeah. You know? it's, it's a projection of the society he's living in at the time was interesting. And, and so there was a, there's, a, there's been a lot of research about the specific way that these people interacted with the commons and their cattle. And, you know, there were rules. That's what's so amazing. And these poor people, they had to eat these animals. It wasn't like they're like, oh, I can make more money if I put another one. Let me get another. Let me get another. Like, <laughs> no, they had to breed them. They had to then eat in milk. And it it wasn't like they could suddenly just flood any, any kind of pasture with additional animals anytime they wanted. And also, know? I mean, you've brought this up before, Jason, too. Like if, if I am having uh, all this uh, excess, but my neighbor is starving. Like, yeah. how much security do I actually have? Right. No, it's that's, so, that's it's so strange because I guess you never spoke with an anthropologist, right? Because, like, uh, yeah. you study other cultures who do practice the commons, yeah. right? Or you look at historically the many, 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 many generations that operated that way sustainably, right? right. Like... This is in 1968. He didn't have the internet. He couldn't just email somebody or look anything up. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the anti Harden, okay. or uh, you know, sort of like I guess uh, the I guess like Christ anti Christ uh, Harden anti Harden. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Eleanor Ostrom is who I want to bring up. Mm. She was a political scientist who was actually the first woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics. Hmm. Probably the last best thing that they ever did. <laughs> well, maybe. she. You're right. I mean, she's kind of a hero among what I think of as outsider economists, like ecological economists and people who are not uh, thoroughly engaged in the neoliberal economics framework. So what she did is she actually went out and studied commons rather than theorizing about them like Hardin was doing. She looked at how do these work? How do people manage them? And she found tons of successful examples all around the world and really helped start this big backlash against that thesis of the tragedy of the commons. You might even call it like the triumph of the commons uh, yeah. based mm -hmm. on how well some of them were, were managed. And she even kind of later on, uh, I think in the 90s, Hardin recanted yeah. his thesis. He said, oh, it should have been titled The Tragedy of the Unmanaged Commons. Yeah, let's give some credit to him that he, he did accept that feedback. But, but that's so... Sorry. Yeah. There were no <laughs> nope. unmanaged commons, right? <laughs> well, that's when true. We, when you defined yeah. them earlier, Rob, yeah. you talked about there being two key ingredients, right? And one of them was how they were governed. Well, Yeah, I think he's... I mean, in essence, if you don't have the good governments, governance... 
they become un- unmanaged commons and maybe then they get de- denigrated. Yeah. yeah. Degraded. I mean, you could, you can definitely find examples of, of commons that have, have suffered and sure. uh, been degraded, but it's, that's why, right? right? The governance breaks down. So you're exactly right, Asher. In fact, there's a, a guy named David Bollier, who's like a, a kind of a commons yep. guru. And uh, he wrote a book called The Commoner's Catalog for Changemakers. Really, really good. We're going to come back to this in a, in a bit. But in that book, it, it talks about how the idea of unmanaged commons, that's, that's already an oxymoron right there. Yeah. Because as you say, that's part of the definition of a commons is that it's, it's managed. What Hardin's talking about is something more like a free-for-all or you know, something that, that people are not working together on. And uh, there was this... Um, this guy uh, who, who kind of like us, I guess he likes to throw stones at uh, at people that can't fight back. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, this guy Lewis Hyde. He said it should have been called instead of tragedy of the commons. It should have been called the tragedy of unmanaged laissez faire commons pool resources with easy access for non communicating self interested <laughs> individuals. Yeah, or as I like to call it, the tragedy of a shit show run by sociopaths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is the modern day economy, right? Right. 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 Oh, man, that that, that is... describes most cor- corporate cultures in this uh, in this nation. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I found fascinating about all of what we're talking about is we see the coming together of this package of beliefs and practices that will eventually be known as neoliberalism, and that is a topic of a future episode. So we won't go into too many details, but. The notions of private property, of commodification, of this rentier class, of of simplifying the culture and the landscape, of globalization, all these things you see manifesting at this period in history with the start of the Industrial Revolution coinciding with basically the, the obliteration of most of the commons as a source of livelihood for mm-hmm. people there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's that's the dream, right? To join the rentier class. You know, <laughs> sit back and you guys pay me a bunch of money while I do nothing. That's you, that's uh, don't don't talk about the lazy peasants, right? right like, talk right. about the lazy rentier yeah. uh, class. And this well, is the economy we have now. I know. Even if it's not about like a rentier class, you know, owning property and land that people are working, right? Owning everything, essentially. Oh, they own, like stocks right. and intellectual stocks. property. Like it, it's gone. Housing. Into, yeah. You know, I mean, sure. now we've got a rush of these Commercial big property. hedge funds buying up housing, you know, getting into that game. They just sit back and they, they make profit off of, of people. Oh, well, so, that's, so but nice. it's fascinating to think about that Britain was a colonized territory since the Norman Qu- Conquest in the 11th century. And the elites that were in charge were not really from the same clans as these commoners. And this division then seems to be feeding into this gross inequality in land use that is building up during the Middle Ages. And then there's this point where we're talking about that it accelerates in the early Industrial Revolution to produce this model now for empire and development that is then spreading around the globe. And this guy named Simon Fairley, he's, he's really into sort of the history of, of agriculture, which of, if you're studying that, you know, where he lives in... in um, in Great Britain, that really includes then how agriculture changed as a result of the loss of the commons. Mm-hmm. And here's what he says, quote, Britain set out more or less deliberately to become a highly urbanized economy with a large urban proletariat dispossessed from the countryside, highly concentrated land ownership and farms far larger than any other country in Europe. Enclosure of the commons more advanced in the UK than anywhere else in Europe, was not the only means of achieving this goal. Free trade and the importing of food and fiber from the New World and the colonies played a part. And so did the English preference for primogeniture, bequeathing all your land to your eldest son. Hmm. But enclosure of common land played a key role in Britain's industrialization and was consciously seen to do so by its protagonists at the time. Yeah, it's like a... Unbelievable confluence of events. and mm-hmm. uh, It's a watershed moment, dude. Right. Well, but part of the confluence, too, something else we talk about all the time is the fossil fuel piece, right? Yeah. It's like around that time that coal deposits are turning Britain into this superpower, and uh, they're industrializing the hell out of everything, and then they, they're exporting all these finished goods around the world that's coal-fired. 
but they're also exporting people who are right. desperate to get away from, <laughs> right. like, you want to work in a coal mine? No, not really. You want to work in a factory? No, not really. Well, then go colonize the rest of the world. You want to get out of prison? Go to Australia. Right. <laughs> right. So you got this uh, giant global empire developing out of that, too. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not just how the economy is operating you know, people's relationship with land, this dynamic of, of class and power, this enclosure of the commons is transformed mindsets and belief mm-hmm. systems. It's, it's, it's interesting to think about, but like we, we really do act as though individual property rights is like, like a law of nature, right? I mean, we have all these legal systems based to, to sort of codify this stuff. But it's much, so much of law is basically possession and property, a huge course, amount. Absolutely. Yeah. And we could have done a watershed moment on the first lawyer probably, and that would have been interesting. <laughs> but let's just step back for a second and just recognize, right? It's not a law of nature, right? It's not. In fact, the alternative, right? This idea that that our relationship, and we've spoken about this mostly from the standpoint of humans managing land and natural quote unquote resources in common with one another. We haven't even talked about managing in common with other species, right? right. Which I think we, we need to just reference. But th- this, this approach of not seeing land property as that possessed by the individual or the family has been the norm, has been the dominant paradigm for most of our history as a species. So what we are living with is actually an anomaly, but it's so deeply embedded in our mindset that it's like impossible to imagine that you could, how do you have a house if you don't own it? It it is weird though. I mean, I I feel like I questioned this as a little kid, like the whole notion of I, I want to go across that creek to get to whatever was on the other side. And it's like, oh, that's... That's somebody else's land. They own that. You can't go on. Like what? It just felt weird. Like really. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you're right. It's a it's an anomalous time that we live in where you're not able to to freely move about like that. Yeah, I've heard it termed as like we cultures turned into I cultures, and that was very unusual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, there's even been language changes that are associated with this enclosure of the common. So. The word trespass, it went from meaning a general wrong against someone to meaning entry on another person's property or grounds without legal authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, the word occupation, that's another one. It went from meaning occupying or holding office to occupying or possessing real property. My favorite word evolution here, uh, it's less documented than those two, Mm. But the word landlord went from meaning someone who stewards the land to douche-o-matic scum pumper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, douche-o-matic scum pumper. Okay, nice one, Bob. How long did you work on that? Uh, I, I, uh, How many beers? I've always, always appreciated people who can take swearing up to another level. Yeah. You know yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm not. What what is a scum pumper? <laughs> <laughs> I think they go into the septic tanks. Maybe. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> that could be a job for me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna look into that. I'm thinking about what this means for the future. You know, looking ahead. You know, part of what happened then is you've got this. You've got this reliance on your community and your place, and then you end up starting to rely on then the employment and the state. So. There's a guy named Stephen Quilly writes about this. I find a very interesting Canadian academic where the market state sort of took over what he calls the survival unit. Hmm. And so you used to have these local based survival units, but then that shifted to becoming a wage laborer and you get integrated into some global trade pattern, right? Mm-hmm. And and now, you know, you don't know how to even, you don't even know what mushrooms will kill you or what, what are tasty, right? So... He, he traces this back also to the enclosure movement as sort of a loss of the ability to have livelihood in place. That's really amazing because you, you see people falling out of that survival unit now. Like the people, I mean, all around the U.S., people are living on the street and the numbers right. are, are mushrooming. Right. Well, that's the thing is what he talks about is that the state market sort of duopoly that's supposed to be the trade-off we make, right? Like right. if we're no longer going to have our livelihood in place, our survival unit be 
be the place, be the commons, be the commons, then it has to be the state market system. Right. Right. But that is starting to fail. Well, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It hasn't, it's not exactly delivering, right? No, it's not delivering. And there's actually tons of people. I mean, of course, the hippies with the back to the land movement, but you've got all these sort of Christian conservative types that are homesteaders. You know, you've libertarian bents, more neo-green type agrarian folks, organic farmer type people. There's actually a lot of interest in having more livelihood in place. And he looks at the failure of the state market duopoly as necessitating that you kind of rebuild this third leg sort of of a, of a sort of a modern a modern survival unit. You know, maybe the state market system doesn't disappear immediately or anything like that. But if, it, if it's going to weaken, if it's going to leave a lot of gaps, rebuilding this local place, this livelihood in place as, as, a, as a means to have some form of a survival unit going forward. Hey, you guys know our British analogs, Dave and All. They do a comedy podcast about the environment called Sustainababble. That uh, yeah. And they're a third smarter than us, right? Because they cover the same ground with just two of them, was <laughs> we have three. I recommend them if you speak European. And I think you're going to understand European, them European, I'm a PN, we're all they, PN. They are, uh, yeah, probably smarter, funnier than us. But definitely, if you like Crazy Town, give Sustainababble a listen as well and, and support that show. decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> my life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> so it's a little bit difficult to talk about doing the opposite when so many of our comments have been eroded by this huge legal infrastructure that, that we've been talking about. But there are some comments that still exist and the, the key is to manage them properly in a way that they can last over the, the generations and, and still provide for what communities need. And going back to our, uh, our economic hero, Eleanor Ostrom, people who have looked at her work have listed these eight rules for managing a commons. And I, I found this in an article that was based on a, a book by Derek Wall, and the book is called Eleanor Ostrom's Rules for Radicals. Hmm. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and read you guys all eight of these rules, but I did want to cover a few things that, you know, on some level might seem kind of like, well, of course you should do that. But, you know, uh, on another level where we're stuck in this private property mindset, you know, maybe maybe it bears talking about. So one of them is that commons, the rules for, for managing it should be dictated by local people who understand local ecological needs. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is you got to have participatory decision making. People are more likely to follow the rules if they had a, a played a role in making those rules. Yeah. Uh, third one is that the commons have to be monitored. And this was interesting to me because the idea is once the rules have been set, communities need a way of, of checking that people are actually keeping them. And the idea is that commons don't really run on, on goodwill. They run on accountability. So you're not quite a utopian, anarchistic radical. You're actually trying to get accountability, making sure people follow what they say they're going to do. That's good. That's right. That's we know good. that I'm a douche-o-matic scum pumper, not a uh, <laughs> utopian whatever the hell well, you... Well, <laughs> we could borrow some practices, you know, from, from the, the folks who were pushing for enclosures of the commons, and we could behead people if they're not... That's you know, right. 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 <laughs> Stuff them into a swan. Th <laughs> this one was really interesting, too. Uh, it's the last one I'm going to share with you guys, that the, the sanctions for those who abuse the commons should be graduated. You don't just throw people out the first time they break the rules, because that just creates resentment in your community. Instead, you'd have systems of warnings and then fines and, and make it so your reputation gets dinged and, and that kind of thing. So it's... Uh, Pants them in public. Yeah, you put yeah. it in the stocks. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But uh, no, I mean, the, this, this stuff's really interesting. Like, if you want to have a well-functioning commons, you obviously have to have governance and, and structures that that help you manage it. I want to know how to be a commoner. I want to be a champion of the commons. How well, do I do that? I, 
I got the perfect book for you. Okay. Danny, the champion of the world. Ever read it? No. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, come on, man. Roll doll. Danny, the champion of the oh, world. Oh, the, uh, the Willy Wonka guy. Yeah. Okay. You wrote a great book. Um, and it's all about Danny and his father. And his father goes off at night to go poach pheasants <gasps> that are owned by this this asshole wealthy landlord dude. Whoa. Landowner guy. He needs Robin Hood on his side. And, wow. uh, and Danny has to go and rescue kind of his, his father. Oh. It's actually a great read. It's, it's not going to give you like a blueprint for how to be a calm <laughs> well, okay. necessarily. But. In, a, in an irony for this particular podcast, a share is giving us the children's book and I'm going to give you the adult book on okay. this subject. <laughs> uh, it's usually reversed there. But um, we mentioned David Bollier in his book, The Commoner's Catalog for Changemakers earlier. And I, I read through it and it's, it's really good. It's actually short, it combines a ton of really awesome information. And as a bonus, Post Carbon Institute is mentioned in the that's book. That's the only reason mm-hmm. you like it. Right? Um, but basically, he says, you know, this is a book that's about the art, culture, and politics of commoning. It's the practices of talking with each other, coordinating work, experimenting, figuring out solutions to shared challenges, and how to make them local, distributed, and fair. That sounds pretty damn good to me. And the book really does follow through on that. It has lots of really awesome examples. So yeah, let's let's it, let's let's talk about a few. You know, I think some basic ones, but there are steps in the right direction. Use your your dollars, your purchasing power, to support cooperatives. You know, there yeah. are many cooperatives that are out there. We've got a, a co-op here in town. You know, or a local grocery store. There are all kinds of cooperatives that exist. Some of them are employee owned. You mm-hmm. know, and and operated. So put your dollars there rather than putting them into some privately owned business or some publicly traded company. There's also just, uh, again, a small example, but part of pointing in the right direction. You know, we at PCI and and all of our publishing that we do at resilience.org and publications that we do, we often turn towards creative common licenses to get images. You know, there, there are people who write things and they publish them using a creative common license. So the whole thing there is to just put it out into the world, not seeking to profit from it, not seeking to own copyright and control and ding people if they've, they've used it, but, but using this creative common but- license. It's also worth adding that there's cool governance structures around yeah. a Creative Commons license, like about how you can share it, what you're allowed to do, and making some kind of derivative product from it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, really, uh, really useful, like you say, for people who are putting information out into the world. Yeah, and I, I run a, a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture. So I feel that's part of this as well, because basically I'm taking this land here and growing food for local people. So it's I feel it's part of sort of, of the local provisioning movement. And there's all their ways of doing this too, you know, supporting land trusts that maybe allow for some livelihood to occur via that land. Some can be explicit agrarian trusts, for example, but even other land trusts do do things like that, allow for grazing rights or or farming even. So I think there's ways also then to maybe people that come together buy land around where they live for that purpose. Yeah, and if if you're just looking to get kind of more informed about how to champion the commons, like we said, there's David Bollier and and his book. Uh, I also have uh, worked a little bit in the past with a really smart guy named Jay Wall Jasper, and he helped found a group called OnTheCommons.org. They've got some really good stuff. Yeah, and I think the last thing, this is more challenging. We talked a lot about things being locally based, local decision making, local you know, local commons in a sense. I think we also have to think about the global commons, right? Mm-hmm. And Peter Barnes and others have been leading uh, the charge on seeing, for example, the atmosphere, you know, yeah. the oceans. Uh, the Amazon basin, for gosh sakes. Yeah, as right? as something that has to be held in, in the commons, you know, the air, the quality of the air, the, the, the climate is something that is not just shared by humans, but shared by, by all species. And this is something where you see, like, a lot of what we've been talking about is sort of the principle of subsidiarity, where you, you push management down to the local level as much as possible. But when you're talking about the global commons, it's still, you know, this has got to be at that more, yeah. at that more nation state level as well. Yeah. But, but the big, there's, I think there's got a lot of work that has to be done on legal shifting of property rights and making it more possible for 
common type things to, to take place. And there's also the mind shift, right? Yeah. So just recognizing this, this whole idea of private ownership of every goddamn thing. Yeah. Maybe has not always been the norm and it may not be the way to get through in the future. Well, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to get started by going down to the local co-op. I'm going to buy some fence posts, some barbed wire, and I'm going, to en- I'm going to enclose a little little piece of property over here and uh, do my thing. You're going to become a lot of the squatters, <laughs> squatter rights. Just go for it. You're a scum pumper or whatever that is. <laughs> We want to give a special thanks to Ilana Zuber, our star researcher of the watershed moments through history. Without her work, there's no way we could have covered such sweeping topics this season. Yeah, and we also want to thank our other outstanding volunteers. Anya Steyer provides original artwork for us, and Taylor Antal prepares the transcripts for each episode. And a big, big thank you to our producer, Melanie Travers, who helps us bozo stay professional. And finally, thanks to you, our listeners. If you want to help others find their way to Crazy Town, please drop us a five-star rating and hit that share button when you hear an episode you like. All right, guys. uh, Great sponsor for today, the, uh, the Marianas Trench Holdings Incorporated. Hmm. These guys are are thinking long term. These guys are future. Finally, oriented. a freaking company that thinks long term. I'm yeah. excited. What do they do? Come on. Well, yeah. Think about uh, most of the property on the surface of the planet has already been parceled out and bought up. Right. So, um, you know, savvy investors are looking for the next place to go. Sure. So and deep, deep, deep in the ocean. Oh my gosh! The so deepest place on, on Earth. The deepest place on Earth. But right. a lot of people don't realize. There's a lot of life down there. Most animal phyla, most multicellular life, you can find representatives of them even at the darkest, high pressure. So you're saying depth. there's a moose in the Marianas Trench? Nothing quite <laughs> like that, but there are there are chordates on the same same phylum that that moose are in. Okay, but they're I'll called, take your they're word called for tunicates. That. They're little sea sponges. So so yeah, um, often confused for moose. Okay, but. There's a real advantage here, though, guys, because you think about it. This is all about hedging. You got your property in New Zealand with the bunker, right? You may have something in the Swiss <laughs> I do Alps. have that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You're in Montana. You, 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 you've I'm covering you spread, my bases. You've cut, you're right. yeah. Go to the deepest, darkest depths of the planet. Oh, so because, like, this is like not plan B. This is plan Z. Right. This like the collapse Z. comes. All those properties you own across the planet, that, that's all wiped out. Right. right, but if you you can own a piece of the Marianas Trench, this is great because those little uh, what do you call them, spongy guys? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be almost Sponge all the animal phyla are down like there. Like after a couple of geological eras pass by, uh, post collapse, that could be like my nephew oh, climbing right. out of the 20 ocean. Twenty million years. I mean, that's where it's going to recall. <laughs> Talk about start. long-term investment. Exactly. This yeah. is a long. They are thinking long play, nice. folks. Long, think okay. about. We like get, it. Get Herod. your uh, well, you buy stock. Get your stock in Marianas Trench Holdings. Yeah, get 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 a piece of the holdings of the Marianas <laughs> Trench, folks. Crazy town. Da, 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 crazy town.